So, we started on uh, animation, we will continue talking about animation. So, what we basically started looking at uh, was uh, the usage of splines in the context of animation. So, so we are going to look at uh, one of the uh, applications where splines can be used for the purpose of animation. So, so I call that as uh, spline driven animation. So, the idea here is the question uh, which I am going to pose here is that let us say you have a trajectory specified in space where the movement of the camera or the object is taking place and it is desired that the motion along the path which is generated by the spline has got uniform speed ok that is what we want to obtain. Now, the issue here is that let us say if I have a two dimensional case where x and y are represented through this q u. So, it is a parametric curve in u where u is between 0 and 1. Now, if we want to generate the movement along this curve with the uniform speed, what we really want is that for a given time interval, the distance which is traversed along this curve is the same right. If I fixed let us say interval t is equal to 1 or 2 whatever time, then the same amount of distance I will be traversing along the curve right. So, basically it is an equidistance traversal along the curve. Now, one uh, may start wondering is that the fact that it is a parametric curve in u, then will the uniform or let us say equi distance interval in u would provide me an equi distance traversal along the path? The answer is yes or no? No, no because it is actually a polynomial in u right. And so, if we are talking let us say cubic case, then it is something like a u to the power q plus b u to the u square plus c u plus d right. So, clearly that is not the case right, it is not a linear segment where we are trying to traverse, it is actually a curvilinear path right. So, one thing which is desired from here is that I want to have equal arc lengths right for some spacing in u right and this equal spacing in u does not guarantee equal arc lengths that we have established right. So, in some sense I am trying to reparameterize this curve in such a way that that parameter gives me the point or the location on this path at an equal interval if the parameter is with an equal interval ok. That is a desirable situation. Now, the question is can we do this? We can. So, how, how can we do it? Any suggestions? differentiate with respect to time ok. Uh, well, the thing is that see it is a, it's a very interrelated problem. We want to traverse equal distance here which is the arc length right and that is what we want to use it as a parameterization to give us the curve. So, we are sort of looping around right it is not it is not analytical ok. So, I cannot solve it analytically. 
So, now the way we want to address this problem is let us let us see it. So, let us try to see uh, the the measure which we are using the arc length how do we compute that from a given curve right. So, let us say if I assume that the curve is a cubic curve represented through this right A, B, C and D here uh, would turn out to be the vector terms right because this is actually I can get the x coordinate also using this y coordinates and z coordinate right. So, so given that I have a cubic spline curve represented in this fashion which is shown here and let us say at a distance or an interval of d u on this curve I have a point q u and I have a corresponding point q u plus d u after the interval d u. Now, if this interval is small enough I compute d s which is the arc length. So, I am assuming this is equal to this right for a small enough interval then this is nothing but the distance Euclidean distance which would be computed between this point and this point right which is nothing but square root of d x square plus d y square plus d z square right just for from here d x d y d z just that distance. Now, the fact that I am using a parameterization in u I can always represent this in this form does not really change anything right. Then, so I have d s that is the arc length for a point q u and q u plus d u given by this fine. Okay. Now, I take an integral integration of that which I call it as let us say a of u from some starting point for the parameter u naught to u and I integrate this right. Okay. So, this in fact gives me s. So, I am basically establishing a relationship between s which is the arc length and the parameter u from where I compute the curve that is what I am trying. So, in other words q u which is the parametric curve I have with me now becomes this because I can get u as taking as a inverse of s fine. Now, the fact that a is not an analytical function. So, a inverse s cannot be computed analytically right. So, we are trying to find out this quantity which is u is equal to a inverse s in some fashion knowing that this is not analytical ok. So, in other words we are now reparameterizing in s with this relationship either you say s is equal to a u or you say u is equal to a inverse s. Right. So, so as far as the formulation is concerned we are able to do a reparameterization in s of q u. The fact now we have to figure out how do we do that computation. Right. So, let us see. So, what, what is the problem we are stating? We are stating the problem as find u is equal to a inverse s that is the problem we are stating given that we can actually compute s in some fashion fine. Now, there is a property which can be of help which is that this a which is the relationship function between u and s gives us a monotonically increasing value 
I mean that is a fundamental property we need to have for the parameterization in the sense that if I have u 1 less than u 2 then a u 1 is going to be less than a u 2. So, this monotonicity has to exist fine. So, let us say if I, if I have a u given like this then it has to monotonically increase from u 1 to some value u 3 right. Now, the state of the problem becomes that given let us say the interval of u, the total interval of u, given this relationship as a u, right, how do you find out u for some value of s, let us say s alpha, right. So, how do we do that? We can use this property. Okay. So, we can actually do this using what is called as bisection method. That somebody suggested earlier one can do some binary search kind of a thing. So, it is a bisection method which exploits this monotonicity because let us say for some s alpha one can start with the entire interval you have of u in this case say u 1 to u 3 you obtain u 2 which is in the middle find s 2 corresponding to this u 2 hmm. Now, for the given s alpha which is known to you, you look at how this is related to s 2 right and use the monotonic property stating that if s alpha is less than s 2 would basically imply that u alpha is in the interval u 1 u 2, it is on one section of the interval which is u 1 u 2. If s alpha is greater than s 2, u alpha is in the interval u 2 u 3 right and this you continue. So, you, you keep doing this bisection depending on how you are located in each of these interval right. So, once you have figured out that let us say s alpha is less than s 2 and this happens to be the interval and you are let us say still far from s alpha having computed s 2. So, you compare s 2 to s alpha if the difference between them is large you do again the bisectioning keep doing that until you satisfy some threshold right. So, this is using bisection. Now, what have we done? We have basically computed u alpha provided that we could get s alpha. fine that is an underlying thing assumption. Now, how can we get s alpha? So, basically looking at how do we get s. Now, so this is the the formula for s we have already looked at which is an integration of this. Now, q u is known to you in parameter u and let us say we assume this to be a cubic case. Then what we are saying is that, so I can actually do a substitution of this that means, the individual terms for x and y and z from q u which will be in terms of u 
take the derivative here with respect to u, substitute here, do the squaring, take the square root, get something like this. So, basically this expression can be written in terms of u. Fine. Now, what we are what we need to do is we need to get this s. Now, this is sort of hard, right? Analytically, you cannot find out. Therefore, you have to apply some numerical method. So, have you studied the numerical methods for getting the, the integrals? Simpson's method, Newton-Raphson method, all of these, right? CS two ten. So, one of those use it and get this numerically fine. Now, all this looks good, good means yeah, one can do it, but there are still problems I mean even doing this is, is not so easy. So, alternatively what you can do is you can use chord length parameter which is straightforward, you have seen it, right. So, there we are saying that this parameterization u is actually determined by the chord lengths between the data. So, if I have the data at different points, so all we are doing is computing this chord length, which is the <coughs> distance between the two consecutive points. and use that as parameterization. So, this we have seen it earlier while we were talking about parametric curves, even for getting the interpolating splines. So, chord length parameterization is in some sense approximates arc length parameterization. Right. If you think that these chords are you know small enough and would capture the distance along the curve. Fine. So, computationally it becomes handy, you do not have to do all that integration business. Okay. So, so now what what have we basically achieved we basically achieved that there is a there is a way by which you can find out the position of equidistant points on the curve using reparameterization that's what we have seen so that gives us the possibility of obtaining uniform speed let us say, but what if we want non uniform? Right. So, as we had seen before, we are basically looking at. So, let us say there is a some sort of a notion of velocity or speed work, speed curve, which actually relates. S and T. T is some parameter which is let us say your timeline and S is a positional parameter. Fine. So, combination of this is basically determining for you the speed. So, this curve for instance is an indicator to a slow start and a slow end. Now, the in order to incorporate this it is sort of very easy, because the first step is going to be given this t parameter, which is the indication of your frame number or the time, where you want to compute the position along the curve. You get the parameter s, 
which is nothing but through this function which is known to you you get this s use this s for getting this okay so 1 2 and 3 that's the third step that would locate your point here fine so we can incorporate this velocity curve to locate points along this curve okay and this itself could be a spline curve right so splines can be used not only to give you a spatial path can also give you the speed path or speed curve Okay. So, so this is let us say some of the applications we can think of using splines other than just doing an interpolation of the keyframes. Like earlier we said that keyframe uh, in betweening can be done by interpolation and that interpolation can be linear interpolation or it can also be using splines. But this is in a slightly different context because here we are specifying the trajectory or a path and you want to move along that. So, this is useful if you want to for instance design a walk through of a scene fine. Okay. So, next I will basically give you some sort of an example of generating animation which you must have seen. Uh, so, have you seen uh, morphing? Morphing. No. Okay. So, if you have not seen you will see. So, this is actually an example where we illustrate the concept of keyframing that is one thing and how do we then perform the in betweening of those keyframes. Okay. So, here uh, what we are saying is that morphing basically means some sort of a transfer transformation of object shapes from one form to another. Okay. So, you must have seen lots of commercials nowadays in television where one form changes to another form or even the special effects in many of the films. Right. So, then what we are saying is that each form from where we want to change or which is a particular shape of the object is considered as a keyframe. Right. Now, there is an issue that if I represent one shape, one object shape using a keyframe and then I need to perform an in betweening between the keyframes, I must have a common topology before I can apply a linear interpolation or an interpolation for that matter. I need to have common topology. What do I mean by that? For let us take an example here. You have a shape like this, you have a shape like this. So, this is one keyframe, this is another keyframe, and what you are trying to achieve is a transformation from here to here. Fine. Now, the fact that this segment has got only two points and there are two segments here and three points, I cannot apply just any interpolation. How do I do it? Unless I have same number of points and same number of segments. 
So, one has to establish some some common topology between them before you can perform an interpolation. So, one possibility could be that you add a point here. If you add a point here, then you are saying that there are actually two segments, three points, here also two segments, three points and then you can perform interpolation to get an intermediate stage. So, clearly this is a very, this is a contrived simple example. Real life situations are definitely complex and hard. Imagine there is a horse and there is a cat, you, right? And they have different number of polygons, different number of points, and you have to morph horse to cat. It would be hard, huh? but it's possible. Okay, so what I will uh, illustrate to you further is an example of morphing. So morphing is a generic term which is a metamorphism or transformation of one shape to another shape, which could be in 2 D, which could be in 3 D. Right? So, what I am going to illustrate to you is through image morph. So, we are restricting this to a two dimensional case. Okay. And this sort of does bring and illustrate it to you the concept of key framing, because there is a notion of assigning these key frames and then performing an in between. Fine. So, let us see. So, here we are talking about image morphing. So, here the problem statement is that you want to do a transformation of one image, let us call that as the source image to another image, let us call that as the target image or the destination image. Fine. Now, again there are certain sort of requirements you need. When I am talking about a transformation which is happening between one image and another image, just the way I was talking in terms of the topology here, one needs to have the sizes of the images to be the same. So, I need a sort of a normalization, which will make these two images of the same size. Okay. Now, uh, another thing is that when you are doing this image morphing, so, let me ask you, if, if you were to uh, ask to do image morphing without knowing what it is, how would you do it? So, you have understood the problem, there is a source image, there is a target image right? and all you are trying to do is obtain the in betweens of this source and target. Fine. How would you do it? Any idea? So, should we interpolate the two pictures pixel by pixel? Okay. So, here is a proposition. The proposition number one is that I have an image, I call that I 1 right? and let us say we have performed the normalization. That means, I have another image, call it I 2 which is the target image. So, this is the source and this is the target or the destination and they are of the e same size, so they are normalized. Okay. So, proposition 1 says 
that do an interpolation of pixel colors right so there is a pixel here there is a pixel here right you mean to say that the same is the same pixel right so x y here you have x y here same location fine so at any intermediate stage call it i i it is some sort of a an interpolation let's do linear interpolation of let's say if i call this as a i1 xy okay plus t i2 xy this is what you're saying okay so you all agree to this yes or no how many of you agree to this one only one two three four five and rest don't know or don't agree don't agree okay so i don't agree so can you tell me why i should not agree so let us take a concrete example see i just put two images like a box right now let me try my <coughs> drawing skills there is one creature here another creature here right and basically i want to do a some sort of a transition from here to here isn't it that's what i am calling as morphing so now do you see a problem what you were proposing last there is a problem the problem is that using this method you are not bothered about the spatial features all you are doing is intensity interpolation of the pixel so you basically doing a cross dissolving of the two images right overlaying one image on the top so if there are two human beings not necessarily fully aligned in the image the cross dissolving is going to have at some intermediate stage four eyes two noses isn't it you don't want that fine so there has to be some feature correspondence without that it won't work fine and then what we are looking at is that once you establish these features between the source and the destination then some spatial transformation or deformation is happening to carry the feature point from one keyframe or let's say from source to 
the destination because this feature may be located at different point. So, there is a spatial transformation or deformation which is happening for the feature. Right. So, then you basically do this deformation for the intermediate frames as well okay, through interpolation for instance and then do a color blending. Color blending is what you propose to to have the blending of the two images. Okay. So, so this is the outline of the method that is what you need. Okay. So, let me illustrate it further. So, this was the source image, this was the target image. If you see it here, there are 1, 2, 3, 4 eyes. two noses and I do not know how many lips. Okay, so, this is when no feature correspondence was done, it is just a cross dissolve all was ascertained is that the size of this image and the size of this image they are the same and they are if you lo look at grossly they are sort of in some sense aligned right, it is not 90 degree rotated or anything even then you have problems here. So, this is actually called as ghost effect yeah. two eyes turning to four eyes like a ghost. Right. So, now to <coughs> to fix this we need a correspondence that means this I needs to go this to this I and so on nose has to go so, I need to specify the correspondences between the source and the target. So, this this can be done uh, manually, this can also be done in some somewhat automatically. Right. So, if you have done image processing, maybe you can do some automation. Otherwise, you have to specify yes this point goes there. Okay. So, so what we have done is we have chosen a certain number of features which we which we want that they should correspond between the source and the destination. Okay. So, then there are several methods and one of one of the method is using triangle uh, triangles for performing this which would enable you to specify or obtain the spatial deformation which i was referring to right so what we have done we basically have marked the feature points onto the source and target image right now, what we need to figure out see just marking these feature points does not really solve the problem. We need to figure out what is the transformation which has happened as long as for these features is concerned you can establish the spatial transformation because you know that this point has gone there right. So, you know the offset in x y for a particular feature point, but what happens to the rest of the pixels in the image. So, in some sense you need to obtain a deformation of the entire image through these feature points. So, for feature points you are saying yes this point goes there. <coughs> But for the rest of points, you would use that information for the feature points. Right. So, we basically what we call it as we obtain the warping function or the warping transformation for the image. Okay. 
So, one of the ways to do is that you have now let us say what you have done is you <coughs> have given these points as the feature points which would correspond between the source and the target. So, this point goes there let us say this point goes there and so on. Okay. Now, what you have done is you have applied a triangulation of these points in order to cover other points in the image. Okay, so, in a way what we are saying is that this triangle corresponds to this triangle. Right. So, the transformation is from this triangle to this triangle. So, for each triangle I know the transformation through the feature points. Right. Then it is a question of finding out for any pixel inside this triangle what is the transformation. Is it clear? So, one thing is that this triangulation which we are applying here, this has got to be the same here topologically, which is that if I join this, this, this point to make the triangle, I should have a triangle joining these three points here. That is what will establish the common topology of the triangulation. Right. If I obtain some other triangle joining this, 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 then I am in trouble. So, I need to have the common topology between this and this. So, it is the same triangulation if you want to see with respect to the vertices. It is just the location of those vertices which is changing, Right, but the connectivity of the vertices is the same. If it connects to vertex 1, 2, 3 here, it also connects to vertex 1, 2, 3 here. Right. So, now getting an intermediate frame here. So, this is what is happening to the source, this is what is happening to the target. Now, we are interested in getting some intermediate form. So, intermediate form which is basically given to you for a particular time interval, let us say if I say this is at t is equal to 0, this is at t is equal to 1. right? So, I am looking at for some t, let us say 0 0.5 time, what happens here? All I need to do is use this time as the interpolation parameter and perform an interpolation between this and this, the triangulations. And get this. So, now I am basically able to perform the shape transformation in time between source and destination for any frame between source and destination, I can obtain what is the spatial transformation, which is nothing but an interpolation from source to destination. The next question comes, how do you render this? You obtain these triangles. How do you render this? Because ultimately what you need is to render the image here. So, how, how do we do that? Okay. See, as far as this point is concerned, which happens to be the feature point marked this point. So, let me use this.
okay see we are talking about this point corresponds to this point fine this point corresponds to this point and this point corresponds to this point fine and we obtained the intermediate frame like this so this point is basically an interpolation from this point and this point right similarly this point is an interpolation from this point and this point okay so let us say if there was only a question of rendering this point then all i would have done apply the same interpolation to the intensity i know this point where it is located so i know the corresponding colors in the image or the pixel values in the image here also i know the point where it is located and therefore i know the color values of this the pixel values of this so all i need to do is perform a linear interpolation between the colors here and here to get the color for this right so it's basically interpolation not only at the position level but also at the color level for this point right but what do you do a point here so when i say for this point therefore you can do for all the feature points the same same thing right just an interpolation of the color intensity the question comes what do you do for this excuse me linear interpolation yeah you have done similar things you have done similar things right so within a triangle if you want to perform such an interpolation what do you do what do you use barycentric coordinates so that's what we do so basically we are looking at an interpolation in triangular domain so given the triangle through p1 p2 and p3 you are representing a point p inside the triangle using p1 p2 p3 so and that is through the barycentric coordinates u v and w and this is how we compute the barycentric coordinates using the areas so that we have seen earlier fine okay so so how do these barycentric coordinates help Well, we can locate a point inside triangle, but how is it helping? Any idea? Okay, so what is the question we are asking? We are asking that there is. an image which is the intermediate image fine so i'll just draw one triangle okay and that can be generalized so this triangle is obtained let's say from these two triangles so this is my source and this is my target why 
So, all we are saying is that this particular point corresponds to this, this particular point corresponds to this and so on. Okay. So, this these points have been located now spatially, you know where the x y of this particular point is. We want to render this and I have already told you the mechanism of rendering this point, which is to take the intensity interpolation at these points. Fine. Now, the question which is being asked is what happens to this point? We said yes, we can perhaps use barycentric coordinates. How can we use barycentric coordinates? Okay. Let me ask you this question in this manner that this point P corresponds to some point here, some point there. let us call this as P target P source. So, now the question is how this P is related to P S and P T. Exactly the same as the vertex point. What do you mean by that? Exactly the same as a vertex point. See, this P is inside this triangle. Okay. Let us say given the point P here, let us pose the question can I locate P T and P S? The same UVW. <coughs> Using barycentric coordinates. Right. So, that is where we use barycentric coordinates. That now, we are saying that now the question which is here is that I would render this triangle and that is the question we are trying to solve. In other words, I am going to find out the pixel values of all the pixels within this triangle. So, given this point or given this pixel inside the triangle, I can obtain the corresponding points for the target and the source which are P S and P T and now I can perform linear interpolation or whatever interpolation I am using for the intensity colors for the point P S and P T because these are known. Okay. So, using this I can render the triangle and if I can render one triangle, I can render all the triangles and get the intermediate image. Right. Okay. So, now if you look at the results which are slightly now, so this is again so this is destination and you see that the eyes and no sort of correspond. Right. So, let me give you an example here. So, this is tower in London, this is your Eiffel Tower. So, you want to make a morphing between these two towers. Right. Now, there is another uh, sort of application you can use it through image morphing. So, here in fact an interface is built where a audio visual output is produced given the text of the speech. Okay. So, there is a database made for different phonemes. So, phonemes is the unit of or the low, lowest component of your speech. Right. 
so there is a corresponding visual corpus or counterpart of the phoneme so when you say p then the lips are closed when you say a ah, then the mouth is open right? so these form the visual counterparts of phonemes right so we call it them visiums given that in fact you can do or perform a morphing when you know the sequence of phonemes required to utter a word or a sentence so you can process the speech getting these components in terms of phonemes therefore the visiums and then perform morphing of them right so let me give you so he's saying somehow how are you okay similarly here okay so you uh, basically you get the impression of visual speech right so this project was done only here about 3 4 years back so more details you can find out from the web page of our vg lab okay now uh let me actually give you another uh examples of this morphing which actually were done as an assignment for image processing course so here the idea you see this is one source this is some sort of a target this is an intermediate form and this is the transitions you observe right and here in fact number of key frames are used so it goes from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 and so on and you see it here right so this is through morphing <coughs> so i don't know whether you have seen this michael jackson's song uh, white and black yeah so that is actually using this okay there's another interesting aspect to it which was done by these students actually so some sort of an aging process so this is an image of yuvraj and this is an old yuvraj somebody made it and you see how this aging is taking place as a morphing process right anyway so we stop here